Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. The year is 1986. It wasn't a kind year, marred with a series of tragedies such as the Challenger explosion, Chernobyl, and the premiere of the Oprah Winfrey show. There was, however, a silver lining to be found on the very tail end of the year with the creation of the Vidya game developer of all Vidya game developers from software. From the birth of From Software came software, specifically video game software. You see, this is when video games weren't as easy as your mom. I'm afraid that's not possible. They were as hard as your dad. Because home consoles weren't yet a common thing, the most financially lucrative games relied on players constantly plugging quarters into the machine for extra lives, or trip after trip to Blockbuster. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with easy games, but video game journalists who wasted their time exchanging fluids instead of honing their gaming skill had the final say in what was good and what was bad. And consequently, challenging difficulty had started to become labeled as a negative quality. Despite what you may believe, games are not necessary for our survival. They are entirely optional to our ability to exist, and they're all ultimately the same. Whether it be jumping the gap in Mario, or finding the secret tape in Tony Hawk, or capturing the enemy king in chess, you are given obstacles, and the goal is to draw satisfaction from the solutions to overcome them. So, if you betray this by removing all forms of obstacles, you betray the entire point for video games existing in the first place. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. And while a large part of the industry has lost sight of this fundamental design, this particular developer hasn't. And whether it be their Soul Series, Armored Core, Kingsfield, they built their reputation around this simple design. Make gaming hard again. So, fast forward to 2019, and riding off the wave of success from primarily their Souls series, From Software shows that it's not some one-trick pony, it's at least a four-trick pony. Maybe five, with the release of their action-adventure game, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. The story follows the protagonist, Weeb Geralt of Rivia, or Wolf for short, taking players through a unique rendition of the Sengoku period in feudal Japan. Our shinobi protagonist is tasked with protecting a child with divine heritage and special blood from those who would seek to use him for their own gain. For a variety of reasons, including a named protagonist and an abundance of full dialogue cutscenes, Sekiro is perhaps the most story-driven of all From Software games, but the core appeal, like most of their titles, comes from the gameplay. I will be using many comparisons to the Souls series from this point forward, seeing as how that's their most popular. It's what most people are familiar with, and while there are many similarities with Sekiro, there are enough surprises to make it look and feel like almost a completely different game, but yet still with that classic From Software touch that many have come to know and love. But all of this isn't to say that either franchise is better or worse. Honestly, it just comes down to personal preference. But one of the main differences with Sekiro is its combat. Both Wolf and his enemies have two forms of health bars. You have the actual health bar, and also the posture meter. To kill an enemy, you reduce the health to zero, 
or you fill up this posture meter, which you do by maintaining pressure through attacking, as well as well-timed parries of enemy attacks. This posture meter recovers when no blows are being exchanged, and it recovers more slowly the lower the health of the opponent. And while this doesn't sound like a huge innovation, it actually has a massive influence on the flow of combat. Making another comparison to the Soul series here, which operates primarily on health bars, the more slow and methodical method of combat is very heavily rewarded. You memorize the attack pattern, dodge or block it, punish, and run out and sunny D if you get hit. So if Wolf starts getting hit, he can very well retreat and heal, but in doing so, because the posture meter drains over time, he sacrifices all of this work that he put in to build it up. You can kill bosses while barely nicking their health bar. As long as you have a well-honed defense with good reaction times, you can focus solely on the posture meter. Combining this with the fact that there's also no stamina bar in Sekiro, the game as a whole feels much faster and action-oriented. There's a bit more to it than all of this though. You also have sweep attacks, which cannot be blocked, and they must be countered by jumping, which also builds a posture. And you also have the Makiri counter, which is learned quite early to counter thrusting attacks. So you also have this sort of rock, paper, scissors dynamic, and recognizing patterns and projecting sweeps and thrusts, all while parrying and maintaining pressure. And yes, I did say jumping, Funny enough, one of the most innovative things with Sekiro is the fact that this was the first From Software game where by pressing the jump button, you jump. There's no building up a gate of speed and then mashing the sprint button to jump only while moving. You hit the button and you jump. You can even double jump off of a wall or ledge hang or grapple or do an aerial death blow. You almost feel like you can do anything the fact that you can just simply jump literally adds a whole new dimension to the game. Not only is there this element of platforming introduced, but also a new depth to the combat. You now have attacks that you must jump to avoid, or you have jumping attacks. This was of course later explored with Elden Ring, which is essentially Dark Souls with jump as far as I'm concerned. But it really does add a new dynamic to the combat and the game as a whole through its platforming. Stealth plays a major role in its gameplay. The environmental crafting has always been one of the developer's biggest strengths, but being a shinobi, Wolf is of course capable of sneaking up to his enemies to perform instant kill, backstab death blows. And while this isn't necessary to beat the game, becoming proficient at it certainly helps, and it adds another new depth in clearing areas because it's now sort of a puzzle. In many areas, the enemies are placed in such a way that you can clear through the entire zone without alerting a single soul. So you're no longer forced into this brute force, fight me 1v1 style, and it does add a new layer of depth and strategy throughout the entire game. Aside from this, you also have the prosthetic system. Early in the game, Wolf loses an arm and is given a prosthetic to replace it, which can be armed with a variety of different tools, such as a shuriken to take out ranged enemies, an axe to counter shield-bearing enemies, or a flame barrel to light people on fire. Wolf is unable to install them single-handedly though. He needs the help of an NPC to do that, as well as upgrading them, giving them different properties. Though it does cost quite a bit, um, some would say an arm and a leg in crafting materials, which you find throughout the world to upgrade them. But it certainly is handy, as it allows you to handily defeat your enemies. All of this ties together with a buttery smooth combat system with unique bosses and enemies where you have this balance and there's this pressure that's introduced to maintain pressure. It's a combat system that doesn't necessarily punish methodical, but yet it rewards aggression. And largely because of this, the combat in Sekiro has a much more fast-paced and action-oriented feel than its soul's counterpart. And it's also because of this is why many say that it's more risky, and therefore, more difficult. <laughs> there are many reasons why people like From Software games. Some mention its atmospheric world, its intriguing stories, its combat. 
One of the things you'll hear the most though is their difficulty and the balance of frustration and accomplishment of overcoming tough challenges. Sekiro, in my opinion, is the most challenging from software game and it's not solely due to its faster paced combat, it's due to its progression system which works as follows. By killing enemies you earn experience and after earning enough experience you get a point which you can then spend on a variety of upgrades such as new attacks, new passives such as improved healing, and aside from this to increase health and attack power you find them hidden throughout the world or as a reward from killing bosses. So the first thought here is that in comparison to something like a Souls game is that it's much more restricted. You can increase specific attribute points, there are no armor sets to obtain, I mean you're even limited to the weeb katana for the entire game, and while this is true, it is more restricted, it doesn't mean inferior or superior. What it does though is that it makes the game harder. In Souls or Elden Ring, there always seems to be some sort of item or build or resistance or weapon type that you can use to trivialize a boss or an entire area or the entire game for that matter. Maybe a fast paced build is better for a certain boss or maybe a slower but heavy posture damaging build is better or you can even be a wuss and use magic. Hey, it's okay. We've all done it. But there always seems to be a way around the obstacle that's put in front of you. Sekiro, on the other hand, because there is less depth in its customization, it better emphasizes one of the most appealing things that people see in from software games, and that's the difficulty. You can't go around obstacles, you have to go through them. I'm not saying that you can't cheese at all, because you definitely can, but it's much harder. There's no real build that you can look up online that just immediately decimates every enemy in your path. There's no Havel's armor set with a spy hand or a dragon tooth. And that's important because it counters our human nature of wanting to play as efficiently as possible and wanting to be as strong as possible. Again, this isn't superior or inferior. It's just different. I will seize any manner of heretical strength. I will do any burden. Behold the lightning of Tomo. From Software is quite well known for its pretty intricate narratives and messaging, so the concept of life and death is no stranger to them, and it lies at the heart of Sekiro. Going back to the Soul series here for a moment, you have the whole Age of Fire and Darkness dynamic where they represent these two fundamental aspects of existence, life and death. These ages embody the cyclical nature of the universe, with the Age of Fire symbolizing prosperity, order. This is a time of stability where civilizations thrive. However, this age is also marked by this looming specter of decay and entropy. The flames of the first flame, the source of the Age of Fire, slowly wane, leading to an inevitable decline, which mirrors the transient nature of life itself, where vitality is fleeting and the only constant is impermanence. Conversely, we have the Age of Dark, which represents death, decay. It is a time of disillusion where the old order crumbles and the world descends into this darkness, but yet within this darkness lies the potential for renewal and rebirth. It is a realm of unknown possibilities where new forms of life can emerge from the ashes of the old. So Death in Dark Souls is not merely an end, but more of a gateway to transformation and evolution, and it invites players to contemplate on the existential questions surrounding life and death, or to throw their controllers against the wall because they get stuck on a boss. One or the other. So for Sekiro, we have an actual protagonist, Wolf, who embarks on a quest to rescue his kidnapped lord, Kudo, who possesses this power to grant eternal life. The Ashina clan has long ruled the lands, but they're put on their back foot via a rebellion, and they find themselves on the losing end of an upcoming war. Cornered and desperate, 
they seek to use the divine air's power to turn the tides and to maintain their rule. However, the game presents this immortality not as a gift, but instead as a curse. It's a burden that weighs heavily on those who possess it, and it also corrupts those who would seek to harness it, such as Genichiro Ashina, who is the game's main antagonist, um, who resorts to pretty drastic measures, including sacrificing his own humanity in pursuit of this eternal life, his fate ultimately being a vessel for the rebirth of his grandfather. Congratulations! It's a boy! The monks of Senpu have achieved immortality, but grotesquely, by way of becoming host to these parasitic insectoid creatures, there are bosses in the game called Headless, who are former criminals given eternal life not as a gift, but as a curse, and turning them into abominable creatures with severed heads who forever linger in the world of the living. The same fate is shared by the inhabitants of Mibu Village, whose waters grant eternal life, but also give them eternal thirst and are unable to die. In the game you can find cherry blossoms, which symbolizes the fleeting nature of life and the inevitability of death in Japanese culture. Their blossoming in spring is celebrated nationwide through the tradition of hanami, or flower viewing, where people gather to admire the blossoms' brief but spectacular bloom, serving as a poignant reminder of the impermanence of life and to renew appreciation of the present moment. Yeah, it's some really elegant and beautiful weeb shit. <coughs> oh, excuse me. In the game, a character steals a branch from one of these trees and as a result it withers and dies. The balance of power is thrown off and, in a way, it sets the stage for the entire plot of the game, with this theft symbolizing the corruption and manipulation that permeate the world. This theme also manifests itself in actual gameplay through the mechanic of resurrection. Wolf, in an attempt to defend his prince, is killed, but he's given the power of revival by the prince, mechanically allowing the player to arise from death once per life, and granting him a second chance to overcome his adversaries. However, this power does come with a cost. The spread of this mysterious affliction known as Dragon Rot, which plagues the world and its inhabitants, serving as a tangible representation of the moral decay caused by the pursuit of immortality. So humans, animals, and even the world itself become corrupted by the pursuit of immortality, and the player is left to navigate the world and its inhabitants, and is confronted by way of critical plot choices. In a few areas in the game, players must decide whether to uphold their duty to protect the divine heir, or succumb to the temptation of using his power for their own gain, and sacrificing their principles in pursuit of this eternal life and power. So, beyond a well-polished action RPG, you're left with a powerful commentary on life and death, both through its narrative and gameplay mechanics. All over the game, immortality is portrayed as a curse rather than a blessing, and it cautions against the hubris of defying mortality and the moral compromises it entails, and it encourages the player to reflect on the value of life and the dangers of unchecked ambition that life and death go hand in hand, and one cannot exist without the other. Death cannot exist without life to extinguish, and life's value is derived from its fleeting nature. What's the matter, Stray? Nothing left to lose. I must depart. The journey to sever our ties with fate will be a very long one indeed. You see, I know it's hard to notice, but I'm kind of a nerd. I'm one of those people who thinks that games are art. I think that they're unique in the sense that 
It's this interactive experience. I feel like it's easier to immerse someone in the story of a game because they're not just sitting back and watching, they're actually taking part in it and they have a say in its story and the fate of the world and the characters in it. It's much easier to drop people in in this way and therefore any message that the game is trying to convey is more effective. So all of this is to say, it's all right, I guess. On its surface, you have this really highly refined action-packed combat system, as well as an immersive story in this expansive world filled with interesting characters, all topped off with the difficult but rewarding nature that's standard of all from software games. In these reviews, I want to give my personal recommendation if it's worth your time and money, and for Sekiro, I give it an F yes out of 10. One of my favorite games of all time, top 10 at least, and something I do recommend experiencing if you ever have the time and you're willing to give yourself a challenge. Thanks for watching my review. This could be a first of many. Um, I want to review all different types of games, so I'm definitely looking for feedback to improve them. So um, please let me know if you have any suggestions to share. And remember to like the video if you liked it, because I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.